Thanks a lot, Alex. And uh, I think it's time to, to jump into this. So uh, Admiral Blair will be, Dennis Blair will be our first speaker. Just a bit of an introduction. Many may know him, uh, at least by reputation, but he had a very distinguished career in the US Navy and culminated that career as the commander of the Pacific, you know, the Pacific Command. Uh, and subsequently had the uh, opportunity to serve President Obama as a director of national intelligence. Um, he's currently the not distinguished visiting professor at the University of North Carolina and an advisor to many initiatives and companies and an advisor to me at Columbia at the, in our recently completed New York uh, Cyber Task Force. So, sir, over to you. Well, thanks very much, Greg, and great to see so many uh, friends and uh, people who've been working in this area for many years on the call. Uh, I'm going to talk about one of the big sets of developments which really will affect the digital future of the world and certainly the US-Japan relationship. And that is the decoupling of the technospheres of China on the one hand and the United States, Japan, Europe, other countries on the other. A little bit of definition. By technosphere, I mean both the hardware and software, which forms the networks, government, private, public, private, in both these regions or countries, and the national rules uh, which governments impose on those networks. So it's both the hardware and software, the systems themselves, and the policies and enforcement uh, uh, mechanisms. Now, there's just no doubt that the these two technospheres are drawing apart. They have not completely separated. And the question is, why, how far, and what can we and should we do about it? And let me start with the why. There are or let me start with the what. There are really two aspects of this decoupling. One is the restriction of the flow of information across borders between China and the West, uh, controlled by uh, policy, controlled technically by the great firewalls and, and other uh, enforcement mechanisms. So that's first. And the second are the restrictions on placed on the sale of ITC services and products across the across the, the borders. Now, based on current trends, unless there's some major change in China, there will be an extensive separation of the technospheres of China on the one hand, US, Japan, other like-minded countries on the on the other. However, the two technospheres as as they separate, as they decouple, will still be built to communicate with each other so that many types of communications and business done by individuals or by commercial companies can continue. And that will especially be true in the manufacturing sector. So for the next few minutes, let me explain the reasons for my assertion, as well as some of the factors that might change it and then recommend actions that the United States and Japan uh, might take in order to guide it in a way that would be to the advantage of our two countries. So first, we need to understand what is causing this decoupling. Two main reasons, I would say. All countries have national security concerns, which are governing both their policies for the networks within their countries and the kind of equipment, hardware, and software that they buy. Second, there are very different data privacy concerns in the US, Japan, and I would add Europe on the one hand, and in China on the other. So let's look at the effects of these two factors. Because of national security concerns, neither the US, nor Japan, nor China wants to have its ITC hardware and software from the other country in its critical infrastructure networks. We are all we're all example, uh, we're all familiar with the Huawei example, which has been effectively banned, which has been a banned from the United States and effectively banned from uh, 
5G Wi-Fi systems within Japan. On the other hand, within China, we know that China is working very hard on an alternative to the Microsoft operating system, widely used in China, uh, but manufactured by a Western company and therefore subject to some suspicion by Chinese authorities. So these are some of the effects uh, of national security concerns, which I would say are fairly common across all three countries. On the privacy concerns, there's a real difference. Both the United States and Japan believe that citizens should be able to control access to their own private data, should decide how it is shared, and that to the extent the government has access to private data, those should be on open and transparent procedures subject to review, uh, not, not arbitrary or, or full permissions to the government. China, on quite oppositely, believes that the government has full rights, has full rights to full access to private data, uh, both to provide efficient services, which they think can be done, the more they know about their citizens, the more they know what they need and, and want, but also for social control measures to ensure that those citizens don't get out of control over social, social media. So with these two different philosophies regarding privacy of, of data, there's very little prospect that big IT companies, which by their nature generate large amounts of customer data, will be allowed to operate freely across international borders. China will continue to insist on access to customer data from Western IT companies if they are allowed to operate in China. On the other hand, if the Western uh, IT companies comply, there's tremendous reputational damage uh, within their main markets uh, outside, of, outside of China. And the United States and Japan, for their purposes, will not favor, will oppose Chinese IT companies operating within their countries, because as long as they are connected to headquarters and updates and, and uh, data that is held in China, uh, there, it, there is the danger, the risk of government data or, or government access to data on Western citizens by the Chinese government with no knowledge, no, no procedures for it. So these, both these national security and pri differing privacy approaches do make it look like there will be some separation of the technospheres. But this does not mean the end of commerce between the huge amounts of commerce that both Japan and the United States uh, conduct right now with uh, China. Let's look at some specific examples. Entertainment flows, for example, movies, to pick one, music and so on. Uh, I, see, I do not see uh, a danger of technical decoupling of, of the technospheres of the entertainment industry. I do see continued policy restrictions uh, placed by China particularly, but, but others, but it won't be a matter of fit, of a technical decoupling of the, or policy decoupling of the technospheres. Um, manufacturing, global supply chains, uh, outside of those that directly involve national, con, uh, national security concerns, outside of uh, ITC uh, companies. Uh, it, is, it is in the interests of country, both countries to be able to have international international uh, businesses operate across those lines. And technically they can be, they can uh, do so, but within each country, I see a definite trend towards China requiring international companies who do big business in China to use Chinese hardware software within, within China. And I imagine that that would provoke a similar reaction by the United States and and Japan, then the subsidiaries of international companies in China would exchange information with headquarters in in uh, United States or Tokyo or in Japan, and similarly for uh, Chinese companies operating there. But nonetheless, the commerce will go on, just not quite as easily for those companies, not quite as uh, not quite as smoothly. Financial services appears to be an area in which China is not yet insisting on joint ventures as it does in manufacturing or is not insisting on 
the use of Chinese hardware and software in the Chinese subsidiaries of international companies. We'll see if it continues, but right now that appears to be another carve out. Now, what can change this, uh, this picture of potentially increasing, um, increasing decouplings of the technosphere? Well, technology as always can change and what appeared like today's policies can be changed by some new invention. What would some of those new inventions be? I would say that uh, technically verifiable means of data security could change this uh, could change this picture. It could enable US IT companies to operate in China if Chinese policy would change. It might allow Chinese social media companies, for example, to operate in the United States and Japan uh, if they could provide technical assurance, verifiable technical assurance that the data generated would stay in Japan, in the United States, and be subject to the privacy laws of that uh, country. So there are, there are technical developments in the protection of data, which could made it, make a difference. Uh, VPNs are, of course, another already existing uh, form of, of allowing a freer flow of uh, data. Right now, China restricts many, allows, allows some in general, making it more difficult for uh, individuals to use uh, VPNs. But there's always the possibility that some technical solution would allow the piercing of firewalls, of, of policy walls that could change this uh, picture that I, that, I talk, that I talk about. So finally, what should the US, what can the US and Japan governments and private companies do about this uh, do about this situation to guide it to a place in which their national security concerns are protected, in which their concepts and, and policies on privacy are respected and, and uh, followed, and yet allow for uh, business to be done in uh, China and for Chinese business to be done within their countries without risking either one of those. Well, there are a, a few steps that I think can be uh, can be taken. Uh, number one, uh, Japan is on the cusp of this um, huge national effort in digital transformation. Uh, it's starting with linking the government agencies together, their IT systems, but there are ambitions to uh, to expand it to both public, private, and private uh, better uh, type, better types of digital digital society, and so certainly as a going in assumption, Japan needs to build cybersecurity into the foundation of this new digital infrastructure that it intends to build. Not make it as it has almost invariably been in the past an applique that's added afterwards. Uh, after the design of the system has been primarily uh, put together for ease of access, ease of ease of moving in information around, that just puts the defensive cybersecurity aspects behind the way behind uh, and and difficult and cl clunky and often not not effective. They have to be designed in at the beginning. Um, I think Japan and the United States, and this is both government policy with uh, private sector help need to take steps to form a more smooth and single market for their IT companies. And I would say this would go for European companies too, so that as long as China makes it difficult for either ITC companies or for digital meat service providers to do business in China, they can at least take advantage of this much greater market that exists among the economies of the United States, Japan, and, and Europe, and so that they are not dependent on business in China for, for growth, but that they can uh, attain tremendous growth across, uh, across this big market. Uh, so this is something that uh, Japan and the United States need to do as a matter of policy, bring Europe along in order to uh, not penalize their companies by depriving them of the China market or uh, giving the sort of leverage that China has when it does have big operations of international companies in its uh, 
in, in its home market. I think Japan and the United States, and this is government to government, have to form a common approach to the national security restrictions that we levy, levy on Chinese companies. For example, on companies that contribute to Chinese military power, either directly or on the civil military fusion uh, concept, which China has adopted uh, recently. Right now, the United States, for example, has an entities list by the Department of Commerce. And in addition, it has a separate Department of Defense list of companies which are judged to be judged to be contributing to Chinese military power, and uh, those companies uh, are subject to restrictions in the U.S. market and and further. Japan has no such has no such list. Uh, the United States and Japan should get together uh, so that they're applying the same standards to identify Chinese companies that pose a national security threat, and they're imposing the same restrictions. Uh, in both their economies. And again, this should be extended to uh, Europe. But by the same token, the United States and Japan should narrow and make clear the restrictions that they impose on their companies uh, because of national security considerations. You can't just say Huawei is a danger and therefore let's, uh, let's try to hit Huawei with whatever vulnerabilities we can find across the uh, Western across the uh, Western uh, countries' uh, economies, whether it be chips or market access or, or others. We need, we need a logical set of, uh, set of restrictions that both countries, both countries can comply or can apply um, uh, to get together. We can do it the same, the same way. Um, one key area under that uh, under that rubric is to clarify the extent to which these restrictions apply to American Japanese companies that are operating in Japan that are operating in China that then do business with some of these Chinese companies that are otherwise uh, sanctioned by the United States or by by other other countries uh, right now uh, if a American company is doing business in, in China, it's probably going to probably going to have to build its 5G network with Huawei. Can it do that or not? Huawei and ZTE to a lesser extent own the, own the Chinese market and it's unrealistic for a company operating in uh, China that needs 5, 5G Wi-Fi capability uh, to be told that uh, it, it can't operate with, uh, with Huawei. So, this is more a US problem, I think, than a Japanese problem right now, but these consistent standards need to be applied and developed. Now, there may be some exceptions, such as those that the United States imposes uh, using, uh, against using Xinjiang forced labor for products in their, in their supply chains, but these should be, should be few, these larger questions of how we ensure that Western uh, companies are not aiding Chinese military, uh, the Chinese military buildup, which then threatens the interests of both Japan and the United States is the essential thing. So in summary, the technospheres of China on the one hand, the United States, Japan, and like-minded countries on the other, I think will decouple in key areas, but I believe they can remain coupled in others. And that governments and companies in the United States and Japan should consult together and and set complementary, if not identical, uh, policies, and then enforce them in a similar manner. Thank you.